Okay. All right, I apologize for the delay. We had a uh, matter to attend to in, in executive session. Okay. So the meeting is called to order at 7.12 p.m. Roll call, Mr. Rosado. Mrs. Colombo. Here. Mrs. Hanlon. Here. Mr. McAllister. Mrs. Peck. Here. Mrs. Peterson. Here. Mr. Pontillo. Here. Mrs. Price. Mrs. Sembler. Here. Dr. Romano. Here. We have a quorum. S salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to, to the, flag the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands. stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The New Jersey Open Public Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of the public bodies at which any business affecting their interests were discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the Westwood Regional Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be sent to the following announce, uh, sorry, to the following, announcing time and place thereof. The Westwood Borough Hall, the Westwood Public Library, Township of Washington Administration Building, Township of Washington Free Public Library, the Record, Community Life, and the PASCAC Press. Okay, minute approval. I need a motion uh, that approval be given to the following meeting minutes, executive session minutes from 32322, regular Board of Ed meeting minutes of 32322, policy committee meeting minutes of 32922, finance and facilities committee meeting minutes of, of uh, 4422, and curriculum and instruction committee minutes from 4622. Someone like to motion? Ms. Sembler, thank you. A second? Ms. Colombo, thank you. Roll call. Mrs. Colombo? Yes. Mrs. Hanlon? Yes. Mrs. Peck? Yes. Mrs. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Mr. Pontillo? Yes. Mrs. Price? I'm sorry, Mrs. Price is not here. Mrs. Sembler? Yes. Dr. Romano? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Superintendent's report. Good evening, everybody. High school teacher Mr. James Thomas has been selected as the school's governor's educator of the year. We are very proud of Mr. Thomas and his accomplishment. His skills, knowledge, and student-centered approach were highlighted in a letter from Executive County Superintendent Lou Delisio. We recently received an announcement that the district received the designation for Best Communities for Music Education from the NAM Foundation for the ninth year in a row. To qualify for the Best Communities designation, we answered detailed questions about funding, graduation requirements, music class participation, instructional time, facilities, support for the music program, and community music, music making programs. Responses were verified with school officials and were reviewed by the Music Research Institute at the University of Kansas. I started a new avenue for highlighting the wonderful aspects of our district. Mr. Patrick Brennan, a high school teacher, is creating Cardinals View videos that I'll post on our social media pages. His first video is already up, so please be look out, on the lookout for more on a weekly basis. Finally, tonight I will unveil a one Westwood Regional School District initiative called Be Kind to Your Mind. Back in my February report, I mentioned an email I received asking me to bring a one Westwood tone to my communication with the community. I have also heard a lot of concern for students' mental health. I have listened to these parents and I hope you like what I have created. Our students mean the world to us. It is so easy to get caught in the hustle and bustle of the days and the weeks and the months. I'm going to ask everyone to pause and reflect on the importance of mental health this month and I'll be sharing more information about what I've created a little bit later on in the presentation portion of the meeting. And that concludes my report. Thank you. And so in light of the three presentations that we have, or the, uh, the three special reports that we have tonight and the student awards, I'm going to forego my president's report for this evening. So we're going to move uh, right into the business administrator's report. Um, 
I'll just make this short tonight. We will be presenting the budget, um, and I will focus on as well <laughs> Thank for, you. Uh, later on for today. Thank you. Okay. Student representatives report. Start in pre-K. On April 6th, we held our spring open house. Preschool students, parents, and other family members were able to come into the building to see our preschool program. The students were all excited to show off their classrooms, as well as the special projects they worked on. In our hospital theme, students love pretending to be doctors and nurses. They especially like taking care of the babies in the baby nursery. With the arrival of spring, preschoolers will begin learning about flowers and bugs and science. One of our favorite science activities is watching our caterpillars turn into butterflies. In the elementary school, elementary school celebrated Read Across America Week. Guest readers, spirit days, and other activities help foster a love of reading and books. K-5 through schools were thrilled to welcome parents and children into the schools for the return of open houses. These evenings helped showcase all the hard work and efforts from students and staff and helped to keep our halls buzzing with excitement. K-5 through student classes are also beginning to attend their field trips and are excited about the additional adventures that these trips will bring to their learning. In the middle school, students and staff continue to complete for the class with the most school spirit. The week before break, they wore tie-dye, twinned, and showed their class colors with the seventh grade winning the spirit for the week. Track season for the middle school has begun. Over 70 <laughs> students signed up, and they get to explore whatever running, jumping, and throwing events they choose. They can change or continue with the events they would like throughout the season. This past Sunday, over 200 students with staff and families had a blast at the color run. Students raised money to help with fun end-of-year activities and had fun themselves throwing and getting hit with color and enjoying ice cream. In high school academics, as national exams approach, AP classes have spent time preparing both in and out of school, with many classes holding nighttime and weekend review sessions. This week, freshmen and juniors sat for the NJSLA and SAT testing, respectively. Today, the chemistry and biology departments visited the Bronx Zoo to study the impacts of climate change on the emergence and extinction of certain species. On Tuesday, the National Honor Society held its annual induction ceremony, in which over 60 junior students were inducted. On Wednesday, April 20th, Mr. Collis's U.S. History I classes visited the Seven Chimneys House located in Washington Township. The house served as a refuge for fugitive slaves in the Underground Railroad during the Civil War era, and also is the oldest home in Washington Township. The senior class has also been making their final college decisions as the national decision deadline approaches on May 1st. Chosen institutions include Rutgers University, the College of New Jersey, the University of Rhode Island, the University of Delaware, and Harvard University, which senior debate team captain Olivia Larson will be attending. In athletics, following the state championship win by our girls' bowling team, Coach Radicasa was selected by his peers as the BCWCA Bowling Coach of the Year. Also, Emily Chevrier was awarded the Silver Level Graduating Seniors Award, which recognizes the hard work of student athletes who have participated in figure skating throughout high school. The spring season is off to a great sport start for all our athletic programs. The boys' tennis team started their season by taking second place in the Hudson Bergen Tennis Invitational. They've been on a roll lately, winning three of their last four matches. Girls lacrosse has had a strong season thus far and will play Ramsey in the county tournament on Saturday. Individual milestones have been achieved by senior captains Kaylee Dunn, who reached 100 career points, and Kelly Dillingham, who reached 200 career saves. Baseball has been off to a hot start, too, as they currently sit at a record of 11-3, and winning their past two games against Mawa. The boys lacrosse team is off to a 10-1 and start and clinched their first league title in program history last night with a win over Pequonic. Several individual milestones have been achieved throughout the season as well. John Ruff became the first bo Cards boys lacrosse player to get 100 career points. Ruff and senior captain Liam Peabody both reached 100 career goals as well. Most notably, senior captain Drew Golden reached 300 career saves and was chosen as North Jersey Male Athlete of the Week after his 20 save game against Tenafly. Good luck to all the spring sports in the coming weeks. In visual and performing arts, our district was selected for the Best Communities for Music, Music Education Award from the NAMM Foundation for the ninth straight year. The Visual Arts Department held their annual Art Fest fundraiser on Saturday, March 26th. Various arts and crafts acti activities were provided for children in the community. On Thursday, April 8th, the Whittington Players cast, crew, and pit attended Fairleigh Dickinson University School of the Arts' production of Beauty, Beauty and the Beast. Students were able to have a talk-back Q&A session with the cast and crew following the show. 
Last night, the Chamber Ensemble held their end-of-year concert, featuring various woodwind and brass duets, quartets, and trios. Clubs and activities. Last week, over 40 members of the Environmental Club participated in the annual Woodcliffe Lake Reservoir Cleanup. Over 100 high school students and staff participated in the annual Blood Drive, sponsored by the National Honor Society last Monday. In the Scholastic Art and Writing Competition, freshman Daniel Shotkin received the Regional Silver Award for Short Story and Regional Gold Award for Journalism. Junior Nate Gunawan competed in the NJ Regional Science Fair and received a first place engineering award for his project on developing a new way to make maglev trains. The Student Body Council sponsored another successful Spirit Week and the Battle of the Classes pep rally last Thursday. Tomorrow, our high school Rocket League team will be competing in the championship game of the Play versus Eastern Region eSports playoffs. Good luck to them. That concludes our report. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay, moving on, committee reports, and we'll start with uh, policy and governance. Mrs. Colombo. Thanks. The policy committee met on Tuesday, March 29th via Zoom. We had a thoughtful and productive meeting. We discussed the student dress code policy 5511. There's no regulation, however, however the policy requires one. In addition, two board members requested that we look into the creation of one. The committee understands the need for a regulation for this policy. As per the policy, Dr. Mortimer will work with administration to fill in the regulation that Strauss SMA provides for this. This regulation does not require Board of Ed approval. The committee discussed Regulation 5600, Student Discipline Code of Conduct. There was a desire to increase consequences for inappropriate language at the elementary level. The committee supports this change. This regulation requires Board of Ed approval. The committee discussed policy and regulation 7510, which is use of facilities. We were looking into extend the available hours. Dr. Mortimer will work with Mr. Rosado to identify the possible weekend hours for facility usage. The wording will be added to the regulation. The facilities use form wording will be changed to reflect the changes with the regulation. This regulation does not require Board of Ed approval. The committee discussed the use of therapy emotional support animals, not service dogs, for staff members. The committee is not in favor of recommending the board to adopt a policy for therapy support animals for staff members. We had a follow-up discussion of policy 1648.11. Since this policy was written for the 2021-2022 school year, Dr. Mortimer suggested that we keep the existing language in place and wait to see if Strauss SMA provides a similar COVID policy template for 2022-2023 school year. She will reach out to them and see if they have any information as to what they are planning. The majority of the committee members are in favor of keeping masking requirements tied to executive orders only. The committee discussed policy 5750.1 equal educa educational opportunity, vaccination status, and policy 5755.1, equity in educational programs and services. These policies did not pass for first reading on the February 17th Board of Ed meeting. Some members of the BOE requested further review on these policies, which were revised on the discussion from the February 17th Board of Ed meeting. Dr. Mortimer reached out to Strauss Esme for guidance and we will continue this, the discussions at our next meeting on May 3rd. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Colombo. Okay, we'll move on to finance and facilities. Mr. Pontillo. Thank you, Dr. Romano. Let me just get to the top of the page here one second. Uh, finance and facilities committee, committee met on April 4th. Uh, we reviewed first the uh, bid overages that we discussed at the last meeting with respect to the Berkeley School bathroom and the George School roof uh, addition to the original um, roofing that was going to be done. Um, the committee agrees that moving forward with those and the overages are acceptable and that uh, we recommend that we move them forward. Um, there was a uh, request to have a review of uh, our investment vehicles as a district. Uh, we had a discussion on that. Um, Mr. Rosado looked into a couple, of a couple of different banks and places where we could put that money. Some of the banks aren't even accepting some of the money, um, but the search continues for growth in our 
quote unquote money in the bank and uh, Keith will uh, update the board as that discussion continues. Uh, we had some discussions regarding uh, facility issues. Uh, there's been some debate as of late with respect to uh, bathroom facilities and usage. Uh, we're going to have the architect review the facility plans to determine whether or not there's actually space available to make uh, single use bathrooms for students uh, for a variety of reasons. Once we have a report from the architect, if there's any feasibility on that, we'll uh, bring that back to the board. Uh, we had been discussing live streaming of sporting events. Uh, our athletic director, Mr. Vivino, is going to look into the options, get back to the superintendent, and uh, make recommendations on how to accomplish that. Uh, we further discussed uh, the aid pay schedule for the 2022-2023 school year, uh, moving away from an hourly rate to an annual, sal annual sal sal salary, sorry, uh, define the work day and the number of days worked, uh, and it would allow them also to have professional development days built into their uh, work contract. Uh, we got an update on the high school uh, media center project. Uh, there's a bid opening that started already and is actually closed, uh, 421. Uh, we'll have a report on the, uh, at the next meeting on uh, the bids that came in, whether they uh, met the standards and what we uh, recommend to move forward with. Uh, we had a review of uh, a number of projects from the 2021-2022 school year. We continue to discuss how COVID has impacted contractors, supply chains, et cetera. Um, there's a whole host of uh, things that are going on in the district. Um, the school vestibules, um, punch list stuff at the middle school, George School Roof, Berkeley Bathrooms, the Media Center, plumbing and electrical assessments, um, faculty bathroom re renovations, asbestos abatement, and the list goes on. But um, stuff is happening. Might not be on the schedule that we're wanting to have it happen on, but it's it's happening nonetheless. So we'll continue to update as uh, these projects are completed. Um, our next meeting date is May 9th at 4.30 p.m. in person. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Pontillo. Um, in Mrs. Price's absence, Ms. Sembler has offered to deliver the curriculum and programs report. Ms. Sembler, thank you. Thank you. Um, the Curriculum and Programs Committee met on Wednesday, April 6th via Zoom. Um, the first subject of our meeting was the new science adoptions um, that are going to go into place for next year for grades 6 through 12. So Mr. Michael Corso presented to us um, the middle school science adoptions, and Dr. Goff presented to us um, the new high school science adoptions. Um, in conclusion, the, the committee felt the main benefit of the Science Education for Public Understanding program um, is that the focus of the resources are now on real-world phenomena, which will allow students to experience science in an authentic fashion. Uh, one key strength of this program um, is that the teaching resources provide guidance to teachers for the differentiation and instruction and the multiple levels of learners. Um, Additionally, there's an online platform that's both easily accessible and user-friendly. Um, the main benefit is that the lab simulations and tut tutorials are online, available in multiple languages. The online platforms integrate directly with Google Classroom. Teachers were in favor um, because they can personalize their courses by selecting activities and embedding their own activities. Um, the second subject we discussed um, was middle school science honors. Um, Mrs. LaForger presented to the curriculum committee um, the a survey of 26 schools who responded that only eight offer science honors. Most high performing districts do not offer honor science. Um, the middle school is looking to drop um, science honors. So starting with 2022-2023, the conclusion is that honor, eighth grade honor science 
will no longer be offered because the new curricular materials allow all students to be challenged as they are ready. Students can still access honors in ninth grade without the unnecessary stress of an honors course in middle school. Uh, the three middle school sciences um, are very different and there's no clear linear progression to honors. Students will demonstrate strengths within the different units in each course. Um, most high performing middle schools do not offer eighth grade honor science for the same reasons. The committee was in support of this. Um, the next part of our discussion, um, Mrs. LaForge presented to us the new middle school schedule. Um, she presented three different options for next year. Um, So the best scheduling option for next year will be is an eight period drop rotate schedule that features 54 minute periods with equal instructional time across the core content areas. These are the main um, differences from last year to this year. Um, so next year students in all three grades will be on the same schedule. Um, there will be a daily 25 minute win period where students will be with their own grade level peers and teachers to receive extra help, which is a change from this year where they're mixed six through eight. Um, during this time, they will have their band lesson. They will receive related services if applicable um, or meet other needs. Um, this is beneficial to the students because they won't, be, they won't be needed to be pulled out of their courses to receive um, these services. Uh, once every two weeks, this win period will be used for advisory meetings, um, which is an opportunity to build community within the school. There will be an increased lunchtime next year for students, will pro which will provide more time for students to eat, to socialize, and to have recess. There was mention of the building principle of a last minute attempt to modify the existing master schedule for 22-23. Um, although the principal shared that faculty are in favor of keeping the current schedule at some revision, um, that would necessitate a lunch period length that is not in compliance with the WEA contract. The suggestion to pursue a sidebar for one year in order to accommodate the lunch period length challenge is not feasible at this time, and for that reason, the school will go with the add drop option instead. Um, the last thing we discussed was the remainder of the school year, um, grades six and seven, middle school French instruction. So the French instructors out on leave for the remainder of the school year and there were no applicants uh, for this leave position that was posted. So as a result, um, sixth and seventh grade students will engage in asynchronous virtual courses with live support and a teacher who assesses the assignments, speaking and writing, um, that the students will submit. Um, while they are doing this asynchronous course, the middle school has slotted their best super, uh, substitute um, to supervise in person and facilitate this technology with students during the asynchronous world language instruction. Um, our next meeting is Wednesday, May 4th, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Assembler. Um, negotiations. Ms. Hanlon? Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Romano. I'd like to thank the negotiation team of the WEA, as well as my fellow board members, Mike Contillo, Kristen Pedersen, Dr. Frank Romano, and our superintendent, Dr. Jill Mortimer, our business administrator, Keith Rosado, and our manager, Human Resources, Jamila Sturgeon, who together we were able to reach an agreement on March 15th of this year. The negotiated terms are, Movement on the guide increment for the 21-22 school year, an increase of 2.9% for the 22-23 school year inclusive of increment. Creation of longevity. Association members who have completed 10 years of service in the district shall receive $500 in longevity compensation starting in year 11 and in each subsequent year of service. Association members who have completed 15 years of service in the district shall receive $1,000 in longevity compensation starting in year 16 and in each subsequent year of service. Association members who have completed 20 years of service in the district shall receive $1,500 in longevity compensation starting in year 21 and in each subsequent year of service. Such compensation shall be considered as part of the association member's base salary for pension purposes. 
tuition reimbursement, the maximum currently at 70,000, shall be increased by the same rate as the Rutgers University graduate per credit rate increases for that tuition cycle as defined in the contract. Courses shall be approved in accordance with NJSA 18A uh, colon 6-8.5. We added middle school head coach at 3,800 and an assistant coach at 3,733 to the contract, as well as the following positions to the stipend list. Choreographer, fall show director, spring show director, and vocal director at the middle school. Also in agreement, the in-school work year for guidance counselors, there was a change in language that guidance counselors, students assi assistance counselors, SACs, and structured learning experience, SLE coordinators who cannot work, can find substitute coverage up to five days of the 10 days with another district employed guidance counselor, student assistance counselors, and structured learning experience coordinators at their respective grade levels. The 10 days shall be scheduled by mutual agreement between the counselor and the building principal or designee subject to the approval of the superintendent of schools. Um, it really was uh, a nice um, agreement amongst everybody. Um, and I know that the two teams will be back at it again not too long from now. So thank you to um, everybody for getting this done. And we look forward to the rest of the year. Well said. Thank you, Ms. Hamlin. Okay, I'm going to move on now to some special awards and recognitions. And once again, Ms. Hanlon is going to speak on the matter since the subject is near and dear to her heart. Okay. Okay. Yes, I, <laughs> I'm very much involved in Scouts of America, so it uh, gives me great pleasure to be able to do this part. I'll wait to, till the superintendent and Dr. Romano get down there. Okay. Motion that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the following resolution be adopted. Whereas Eagle Scout represents the highest achievement of rank attainable in Scouts VSA program of the Boy Scouts of America, and whereas the Western Regional School District would like to recognize Alexander Charles Dole, 12th grade student for earning rank of Eagle Scout, and whereas the Western Regional School District would like to recognize Ile Halil Guler, 12th grade student for earning the rank of Eagle Scout, and whereas the Western Regional School District would like to recognize Mark Evan McLair, 11th grade student, for earning the rank of Eagle Scout. And now, therefore, be it resolved, the Western Regional Board of Education hereby congratulates these students for this accomplishment, directs the Secretary to include this resolution in the official minutes of the Board of Education, and directs the Superintendent of Schools to present the students with a suitable certificate of recognition. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So, um, I'm sorry, boys, I, I should have asked. So, so, now that we've gone through the actual awards, we have a tradition of actually allowing the Eagle Scouts to discuss their projects. So if you'd like to come down one at a time and just share um, just a little overview of your projects with the audience, we'd probably, you know, you're certainly welcome to do that. Could... Is that one of those you go first things? Is that what we saw out there? Thanks, I didn't know that. I see Mark, you took it first. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, I'm Mark McClare. Um, my Eagle Scout project, um, 
Uh, there's a Spectrum for Living home in Westwood, New Jersey. Um, it's a home that houses tenants with developmental disabilities, and um, I took the initiative to um, uh, re-landscape their backyard uh, and make it wheelchair accessible for the tenants and the nurses who care for the uh, tenants there. Um, before I came to the project, they weren't actually allowed to go outside into their backyard and get really much free air. So I wanted to make it wheelchair accessible. I uh, redid and reseeded uh, their backyard. I also put in four birdhouses, two homemade benches, and a raised garden bed out of uh, mason block. That was my project. Thank you. Uh, so what I did for my project was I worked with the Westwood Fire Department and I created uh, six, five hose dummies and their storage units. And basically what a hose dummy is, is that they use them to train new fire department members and also EMTs use them so that they prepare for uh, real life situations. And honestly, uh, this project was really a great project for me because it allowed me to um, you know, really help my community and create something that was gonna leave a lasting impact on my community for years to come, so. Thank you. And congratulations again. Okay, now we're going to move on to special public reports, and we're going to start with the uh, high school work-based learning highlights presented by the high school staff and select senior class students. Mr. Connolly. Structured, structured learning experience, it used to be called. Now it is the uh, work-based learning program. This is our fifth year doing it. The next slide will go over numbers and, and how it's sort of grown each year. Obviously, during COVID, it took a little hit. Um, so if you want to start off. Before I get into this, I just want to, uh, the students will introduce themselves and that. I just want to introduce Ms. Murray. When this program started, she was the exact fit. Before, she, she was a business teacher here. Um, before that, she was in the business world, and the work that goes be on behind the scenes, you know, basically to sort of sum up the program, and she'll talk about this, we have seniors who come to Ms. Murray with what their career interests might may be, career, college, 
Miss Murray goes above and beyond to find a placement for all of these students, whatever that might be. It might be a student who's, uh, we've had students um, work at, with vets. I remember a student about a year or two ago, she came in, she was so excited, she was actually witnessed a cat getting eye surgery. But here you have a senior in high school actually sitting, sitting and, and observing and watching that. Um, just as important as this program, and we also have students that go on to the trades. We place students with electricians, plumbers, and different things like that. Just as important as a student going through this and realizing this is what they want to do, we've also had kids actually say to us, I don't want to do this. That's successful as well. Before they go off to college, before they go to a trade school, or whatever it may be, for them to understand and learn that. So that, to me, is just as valuable and important. So if you, you see here our numbers, again, it's our fifth year. You, uh, for obvious reasons, 2021 and 21-22 took a hit because of COVID. Obviously, not many places looking to take kids on, nor were we that comfortable sending kids out. So as you can see, as of right now, and Ms. Murray has been visiting phys ed classes. Um, she's been communicating with students. She emailed parents today. Um, she's still visiting classes and juniors to try to gain interest for next year. But as you can see, we're very happy um, already for next year. And actually, since this presentation was submitted about a week ago, it's actually gone up from that. So it's great. So Ms. Murray has a lot of work this year and the summer and to make sure she can find a placement for our students. Some students, depending on what they're doing, some students go once a week, every other week, full day. Um, if there's a trade or something like that, there's some students that go every day for half a day, but that depends on what their fit is, and obviously it depends on where we're sending them. We can't tell a place we want you to take our kid one day a week. So again, great program. We're very excited about the growth, and again, we'll, we'll get past the COVID there and continue to grow. So I will pass it off to Ms. Murray. Hi, I'm Ms. Murray. Um, this is my, going my 13th year here at Westwood High School. Um, as Mr. Connolly said, I was the business teacher prior to this. And when we started the SLE program, Structured Learning Experience, and last year the state changed the name, shocking, to Work-Based Learning. So now it's Work-Based Learning. So back in the day when I was in high school, they called it, you know, work-study programs. So either way, the concept is still the same. So if you're not familiar with our program, it is offered to seniors only. <coughs> Excuse me, allergies. Um, and basically what I'm doing and what the school is doing and the employers, we're providing students with the opportunity to prepare for the ever-changing, rapidly changing world. Um, even through COVID, we've seen it even changing more now with what is expected of employers, employees, as well as, you know, even how many times a week you go into the office. So this is really a preparation for the students, whether they're choosing to go to college, whether they're choosing to go to a trade school or going directly out into the workforce. Um, it's gaining a competitive advantage, you know, when you go out there, and I'll talk about it in a few minutes, is you're going out there and you're not just learning about a career field, which you'll hear a couple of our students talk about, you're also meeting people, you're learning about the, the field of studies, and you're also networking. So it's a great opportunity, and the best part is it's hands-on experience that you get credits for. This is something that goes on the students' transcripts. It's speci specific to what they're doing. So if I was going into teaching, it would say Dina Murray, um, education. So it goes on to the students' transcripts, which is a great, again, pro and gives these kids a competitive advantage going off to college if that's what they choose. If you're going into the School of Education, this school actually sees that it's on your transcripts and they show that you have a vested interest there. Work-based learning, um, it's in-depth. It's preparing the students for soft skills. That's what I call these skills. Um, I don't think they lack in them, but it's definitely different um, through COVID. So it's communication, enthusiasm, attitude, teamwork, problem solving, critical thinking, and professionalism. Not like the students here have never done it before, but at 15, 16, 17 years old, it's not the same. So this is just preparing them, and they'll talk a little bit in a few minutes about what they've done. Um, what I do with the students, depending on what career or what workplace they're going to, is I will help the students with resume writing. And I do this not, even if you're not in the work-based learning program, um, just so you know, let's have like a, a job classroom where kids could just apply for jobs all the time. I get, you know, through the community and stuff. So I'll help the students with resume writing, interview process. Most of these kids have never been on an interview before. 
don't even know how to like really answer the phone. They text everything. So you know, it's okay when the person calls. You know, make sure you shut your music off in the background and things like that. Um, it seems silly, but you know, this is the age. I have two teenage sons myself, so I can say it. Communication with employers. You know, I'll sit and I'll help them write the first few emails so they understand how to write it, not just like, "Hey, I'll be in late today." You know, like. Good morning, you know, we just a little more professional and again, just getting them used to soft skills which they're not used to yet and that's part of the program. And the simple thing is dress codes. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, we have to go above and beyond a pair of sweatpants and things like that. So, little things like that. Establish partnerships within the community, um, which was huge these past two years, especially with COVID. We were able to work more in the community as opposed to being able to go out into some of our employers and some of our other workforces. So working with the community, I've worked with the library, I mean the local hospitals. You'll hear a couple of the students working within our district and the schools itself. So it's very important. Um, and it could be anything. It could be volunteer within the district. It could be, um, let's go to the next slide real quick. It could be paid or unpaid. So I have plenty of students that actually get paid for their internships. You know, many employees, Sometimes we'll give them like a grace period of a month and then they'll start to pay them, which is great. Again, you know, they're giving them a sense of pride and you know what? They like me here, I'm gonna get paid. Some don't offer the pay and that's fine as well, but either could happen. It's volunteering, it could be job shadowing. Sometimes people said they can't, you know, give up once a week, but I could give you once a month and you could shadow us. We'll take that as well. Again, any exposure to any career. You know, a lot of students come to me and say, Miss Murray, you know, I wanna go into business. And I'm like, well, what does business mean? Okay, I, I have my MBA, I was a business major. Uh, it could be economics, it could be accounting, it could be marketing, it could be social media. So this is the opportunity for some students to come in. Same thing with medical. I had a student the other day come in and say, I wanna go into engineering. I'm like, okay, so let's talk about that. What type of engineering? He's like, well, what do you mean? And I was like, well, there's bioengineering, medical engineering, you know, civil engineering. He's like, whoa, like I didn't realize all that. So that's part of it as well. And I'll give that, I'll throw that back at them and I'll say, you go explore some of these careers, you research it and get back to me and think which ones might interest you. So that's part of the process. Again, not what they're used to, but if you're gonna go off to college or a second career, you know, how do you just say I'm gonna major in engineering? So these are great things that they do. Um, these are some of the people we have worked with through the years. There's so many more, but as you can see, it ranges from hospitals to the Bergen Pack, uh, Oradell Animal Hospital, where Mr. Connolly was talking about, and that student was one of our first in the program that did the eye, cat eye surgery, and she is still there working. So she still works there. She worked during her college breaks, and now she's an employee there. So she was one of our first. Um, but again, different academies, Manhattan Place Entertainment, a lot of physical therapy, New Jersey Jackals, and as Mr. Connolly says, it doesn't matter. I, New Jersey Jackals, true story, I was on the line at Marshall's. The lady had a New Jersey Jackals jacket on. I'm like, do you work here? She's like, yeah, took her card. That's how we got it. So no one's safe around me. Um, <laughs> gives me another reason to go to Marshall's. And here's are some of our students through the years, just some pictures that we've done um, through past experiences. But I do believe the best experiences are gonna come from our students right now. Um, they're gonna introduce themselves and this is what it's all about right here. So. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Trevor Murphy uh, and I'm currently an intern for Red Barn Electric. Uh, I'm able to do hands-on experience with various different aspects of the electric field. Um, this opportunity has allowed me to learn and uh, make good connections. Uh, I was also offered a summer job there if I, if I want it. I plan on attending uh, New England Institute of Technology in the fall uh, with a major in electrical construction. Hi everyone, my name is Gianna Lacomi and I interned at Brookside Elementary School in the second grade classroom with Miss Iosia. I was able to experience what it's being like in the classroom and made great connections with the staff and the kids. This internship was eye-opening to what my future as a teacher will be like. At my internship, I was able to help in math class, grade papers, as well as play fun games with the students. To top it off, on my last day, the class even made me a book on how to be a great teacher, which I brought with me, <laughs> which reassured me I was making the right career choice. In the fall, I'm attending Montclair State University majoring in elementary education. Hi, my name is Claudia Rivera, and I interned at Sterling Sound. 
which is a multi-Grammy-nominated mastering and recording studio, studio in Edgewater. At Sterling Sound, I did a lot of things for their social media and website, like updating the discography of the current artists they work with. It really helped me be set on my decision to want to work in the music business. I plan on attending Syracuse University in the fall, majoring in recording and entertainment industries in the band year program. Hi, everyone. My name is Drew Golden. I interned in our athletic office this year under Mr. Mavino. Throughout my internship, I was able to learn what his day-to-day -day life is like and really see how busy he is. I was tasked with improving our social media presence throughout the year, as well as revamping our athletic pages. The internship really opened my eyes to the amount of work that goes into making a simple game day run smoothly. Mr. Vivino and Mrs. O'Sullivan Osul are truly two of the hardest working people I've ever seen. I swear, Mr. Vivino has at least three phones. Anyway, the internship is really fun to, to, take, part, uh, to take part in, and I'm enjoying every single second of it. In the fall, I am attending Penn State, where I plan to major in, in communications and specialize in sports journalism. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Michael Kazigian, um, and I interned at the Bergen County Sheriff. Um, I was able to learn about the different steps in the criminal justice process. Um, I've met a lot of different people that were able to give me um, good career advice, like to where um, I wanted to go, because you can't just say I want to go into the criminal justice field. There's so many different parts of it. Um, so through the Bergen County Sheriff, I was able to talk to people, and they were kind of help helpful to. Um, narrowed down, you know, just in a ballpark of where I want to go. Um, and I also got the tour of the Bergen County Jail, which, you know, hopefully you don't go there on the wrong side of the bars. Um, but uh, so the work-based learning program, and I really noticed this over the past month probably, but the work-based uh, learning program really put me ahead of everyone else um, in my college applications. Um, just because I was able to get the experience that um, most people don't get until like their junior or senior year in college. Because, um, you know, not every high school, I mean barely any high school, lets you intern um, where other college students are. Um, and I mean, anyone that I went to, like a lot of the uh, admitted student days, a lot of the um, professors were really um, intrigued with, you know, the knowledge that I already knew going into college, not coming out of college because of that internship. Um, so uh, I'm majoring uh, in psychology and I'm gonna do a, uh, um, a minor in criminal justice and I wa also wanted to thank Mr. Murray for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> and that's it, unless anybody has any questions. All right, thank you for the opportunity to let me do this for the kids and have a great night. All right, thank you, Mrs. Murray, and thank you to the seniors for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and present. Um, next up, we have our 2022-23 budget presentation by Mr. Keith Rosado. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're here tonight to discuss the 22-23 uh, annual budget. Um, I don't have a clicker. Thank you, all the uh, board members. Uh, this uh, budget process starts way back in uh, October, believe it or not, with the principals and works through uh, board committee. A lot of discussion at the board meetings. Uh, uh, to get us to where we are today. So some of the, uh, the key points in the budget today uh, is, you know, where we're focusing on, where we're spending our money. These are the programs that we're, we're focused on. Um, 
we have, uh, of course, our academic programs. Talk more about that if you want to say anything about that. But maintaining all of them. The extracurricular and athletic programs are all maintained. And as we heard from our curriculum committee report tonight, there will be a new science program in grades six to 12. Uh, we'll maintain all of the current staffing levels and we've added new positions in the budget. One is a shared dance teacher for the middle school and the high school. So um, I know uh, registration is going on now for the schedule for next year. So if any parents are listening and you didn't know dance is an opportunity, you might wanna have that discussion if that's of interest to your child. Reading special and additional reading specialists, three elementary resource teachers, and reorganization of the curriculum department, which I touched upon uh, last, at last week's meeting, and I'll have a full explanation of that in tomorrow's parent letter that I have going out. A lot of work will be done toward the facilities, and we're very proud of the planning that's gone into that. So a new or replacement turf for the high school, turf and track replacement, a new weight room, which this school desperately needs, which bring us up to uh, par with other districts. Tennis court replacements, softball and baseball dugout upgrades, electrical panel upgrades to the various schools. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a little bit because that's directly related to the air conditioning. Worms field, we're going to do the DEP applications to get the Worms fields. Uh, together that were promised as part of the referendum and Berkeley and Washington roofing replacement. We're also going to have four class three police officers, an upgraded lens system and uh, critical response group mapping that our emergency responders would use if there were an emergency in any of the schools, they can see right away from the maps that they would have possession of exactly where the emergency is and it provides, it keeps them safe and it provides increased access time to whatever is going on. Okay, the, the next few slides are gonna discuss the impact uh, to the taxpayers and how uh, we're gonna pay for all this. Um, so th this first slide, you know, Westwood Regional School District is the only K-12 regional school district in, in Bergen County. So we're a little different than many other districts in that we are full K-12 regional. Um, because of that, when we adjust, when we calculate taxes, you, you calculate the taxes based on the uh, net evaluation of both towns. And they bring them together and they kind of equalize that value to determine what their current market day value is. This slide is showing us um, the uh, increase in that evaluation to the town. So in the township, you can see it was a $3 million increase over last year's assessment. In Westwood, you see a different picture. You see a $107 million increase in evaluation. The reason Westwood has increased that much and the township has not, Westwood does a rolling re-evaluation. 20% of the town every year gets an actual reassessment. Someone comes in, looks at the homes, reassess them. They bring their, their values to market value. Township has not had a reassessment in a couple years, and I'm trying to remember when the last time was, might be eight years ago. So they're working with the numbers from eight years ago. Westwood is working with numbers currently, so that's why they tried to do an equalized valuation. So when they do an equalized valuation, they take both towns, bring them to a true actual kind of market value, and then they take the total amount and, and figure out the, the ratio of how they're gonna divide the taxes. So you can see over the course of the time how it fluctuates. This year, the uh, equalized valuation of the borough has gone down slightly, the percentage uh, ratio allocation, and the township went up. Because of this change, You see here how it impacts how the distribution of the tax is gonna be. So if you're looking at year to year, the valuation and the increase in taxes, you're gonna see in the, in the borough side, you see a, a decrease overall for the, 
uh, equalized valuation of the homes. Now, what I have here is the tax rate based on $100,000 for every $100,000 uh, assessment of a home. So if your home is worth $500,000, you take that number times five, that's the school taxes for the year. <coughs> on the township side, like I said, they c they're paying more taxes this year, or I'm sorry, the ratio went up a little on them, so they're gonna pay more taxes. And this is annualized amount. So the budget, the appropriation size, or our expenditures, or what we anticipate our expenditures to be in the upcoming year. Um, the total budget uh, for the district is $70 million. You can see how that's allocated and distributed amongst the, the, the different areas within the school. Direct instruction, to support services, to our out-of-district tuition, and other costs uh, around the district. This is the opposite side of it. This is the revenue. This is where the money's coming from. So our district, you can see 80% of our, our revenue stream is coming from our tax sale. We, have, we are budgeting some money um, from our fund balance. Our, um, it was from prior year that we allocated. Um, we are doing uh, many projects this year, and we're w using our capital reserve to fund those projects. You see we have 3.4 million is, is fun helping us fund those capital projects. Uh, you can see our state aid. Um, we received about uh, 3.1 million from the state. Not a lot, many Bergen uh, County t towns kind of have anywhere from three to 8% of their budget is funded through the, uh, the state. Um, also on here you have our debt service. The debt service is essentially the loans that we're paying back from our bond referendums. So that was voted on when we went out for the bonds and it's just the taxes that are, are and the payments that are coming back to pay off those loans. So uh, bottom line in the end, uh, the budget uh, proposed uh, for the upcoming school year has an, a total overall um, impact to tax operating tax levy of 2.66. Total tax levy is 2.54. Uh, the difference is because the debt service um, tax uh, tax levy amount ha was reduced, so that brings down the, t the total tax levy. Um, our budget uh, maintains all our key programs that we have, that we've been funding, creating. Uh, we're still, we haven't cut anything. Uh, and as Dr. Mortimer said, we've actually, we're hiring more people, we're doing more programs. Um, and uh, that's it. Uh, the information will be available on our website tomorrow. At the web, uh, we will also have we have uh, books in our central office and board office. Uh, if anyone wants to see information, they're able to come and see those books. And that is my presentation for this evening. So I just want to take a few minutes to talk about a project that I initiated a couple months ago, again, referencing the parent who emailed me and asked me to bring the district together and also the parents who have spoken out about their concern regarding mental health. So it I had bursts of creativity, and this was really, really rewarding for me to work on personally. I put together, it's all housed in this webpage, and this is, you can find this under my, the superintendent's webpage. I'm going to be sending it out to all the parents and the students and the um, faculty tomorrow. So I had help from our marketing class in the high school, came up with the slogan, be kind to your mind. Um, they also, and I have, I can't forget my box here tonight. They also came up with the design for the bookmarks. So students, grades three and up, are going to be getting um, a bookmark as well, be kind to your mind. But the month of May is Mental Health, Health Awareness Month, so this tied in perfectly with the idea I had planned. 
and there's a bunch of resources on here, and I have a little video I'm going to play for you. But every day I have a video that we, uh, Mr. Brennan, our high school digital arts media teacher, put together, and I'll show that in a second. But every day in the month of May, we're going to have posts on our Instagram and our Facebook pages, uh, just inspirational messages, and these were curated by our Care Plus clinicians. So they were heavily involved as well. They made the content for the webpage, and the marketing classes uh, put the content together and developed the various um, pages. So there's one for elementary students, And these are all written on an elementary level. You can see it's less words and more, you know, pictures. What is anxiety? What is depression? Coping skills. And then we have resources for parents. Middle school level is written a little bit differently. We have the hope line. We have some text and links, a little bit more reading. We have activities for them to fill in for self-care information about anxiety, suicide prevention, and again, resources for parents. For the high school level, same topics, a lot more text, some videos, one minute positive affirmations, one minute breathing guide, Information again about suicide prevention. Additional resources and parent resources. So there's something for everyone. It, there are, we have high quality information for the students. We have high quality information for the parents and it's accessible to everyone. We're also going to be doing buddy classes and that you know, ties into the one Westwood piece of this. So our, our students, you know, the sports, the schools, things are, are separated. So maybe they see each other, maybe they don't. But during the month of May, I asked, we have a, a chart so that students in third grade in Westwood will be speaking to students third grade in, in township. And I gave the teachers complete, you know, freedom as to, I, it has to be done on a weekly basis to have a conversation with your buddy class. But it could be anything they want, if they want to do their morning meetings together if they want to do a read aloud together, if they want to solve math problems and have the students be math buddies, they can do that together. And again, you know, the whole idea behind this, and you'll see it in the introductory video, is your community supports you, and we're all one, and we're all here for you. I want to show you the coping boxes next, because they're coming soon. So Care Plus ha curated also uh, coping box materials for the students so that each elementary school is going to have a coping box. I have, we ordered fancier containers that were in my office, so I didn't assemble that necessarily. But this is something parents that you might want to do at home as well. So if a child is feeling stressed, there's a wide variety of activities in here. So these are gel beaded sensory shapes. They look like they're like squishy. These are fidget poppers which I liked, and I think I <laughs> could use one of these some days. These, I can't quite figure out how to work. Pom-poms, pumpkin fidget pom-poms. I'm not familiar with girls' crafts, really, at this point, um, but I'll see. More sensory rings. These are lupes, and it's more of a sensory fidget type mechanism. This is... Harry, Harry Tangy. And then we also, have, I have crayons in my office, um, coloring books about feelings, the Angry Octopus coloring book. And I love this book, Breathing is My Superpower. So all of these will be in the elementary schools uh, very shortly. This will also be carried through in the elementary media center. Our elementary curriculum coordinator, Kelly Hughes, worked with the media specialists to find uh, books that will be read alouds in the media specialist class. I'll show you some of the titles for each grade. We 
we have our bookmarks. And I have a list of the thank yous that I wanted to acknowledge. So let's just take, it's just a four minute and 59 second video. Just let's take a look because I think it, uh, our speakers came out great. I asked various dignities, dignitaries in the two municipalities to just say something to the students about mental health or taking care of yourself or making good choices, again, to promote that sense of community. also can be a place to find um, that are
an overview of the resources that are available. They'll be coming out um, tomorrow and Monday as well. And I just want to say from a personal note, you know, I, I just had parents in my office today who are terribly worried about their child and the child's mental health. And my heart goes out to every single family who comes to me like that because, you know, not all kids are just coming to school every day and kind of bumping around childhood and, and being okay. My heart goes out to that. And all the calls we've had, you know, about mental health, mental health, so many students, parents are worried about their child's mental health. And I just want to end by saying that I understand from a personal perspective because I lost my mother due to mental health issues at the age of 59. So um, if anybody can out there is sympathetic to the parents and what I see students going to, uh, trust me, I've been there and I understand it. And the more we can talk about it, and that's why you know I came forward with that information tonight, the more we can talk about it, the more it will hopefully help other people. So thank you. Okay, thank you again um, to those involved in our three presentations tonight. Um, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the, the reason why we tried to plug the wire in was because we were concerned that the home viewers may not have been able to hear the presentation. But if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Mortimer said that you can actually run that video from the um, Be Kind to Your Mind webpage that she created and from which you can, and you, and you can link to that from her superintendent's page. So for those who are at home who may not have been able to hear the video, if you go to the superintendent's page, you can link to the Be Kind to Your Mind website and then you can actually view the video, okay? So, so I had mentioned at the beginning of the meeting that we had to come out a few minutes late because we had a legal matter that we had to settle in, um, in our, uh, well I should say that we had to begin discussion on, in, in our executive session um, we, we actually need to continue that discussion, but we thought it was important to get through the portion of the meeting that involved the public. Um, uh, and, and so we're going to actually go through the public forum. And then I just want to tell you in advance, at that point, we're going to break to an executive session again to continue discussion on that legal matter. But again, at that point, what's left on the agenda then are just simply resolutions and then, he, and then, he, and then any ad hoc older new business items. We don't have any scheduled older new business items on the agenda tonight, but of course board members could raise those uh, during the meeting. Okay, so again, all of the public portion where the public participates 
or receives awards will be completed before we go into that executive session. We don't normally do that. We normally would wait till the end of the meeting, but for tonight's purposes, we need to do that mid, uh, halfway through the meeting, okay? So with that, we're going to get into our public forum now. During this portion of the meeting, district residents and staff are invited to address the Board of Education on any topics specifically addressed in this agenda or on any other questions, comments, or concerns that may be in respect to the operation of their schools. The board requests that individuals sign the speaker's list giving name and address and asks that all remarks be directed to the board as a whole and not to individuals. The board asks that members of the public be courteous and mindful of the rights of others, of, of, uh, I'm sorry, the rights of other individuals when speaking. Specifically, comments regarding personnel matters are discouraged and cannot be responded to by the board. Students and employees have specific legal rights afforded by the laws of the state of New Jersey. The board bears no responsibility, nor will it be liable for any comments made by members of the public. If a matter concerning a district staff member is of interest or concern to a resident, the matter should be referred to the responsible building principal, uh, superintendent of schools, or the board of education, either by telephone, letter, or email. Although the board may not respond to items raised during the public forum, all public comments will be considered and may be discussed tonight under the appropriate agenda items or new business at this meeting, at subsequent meetings under old business, or during a board committee meeting if appropriate. Each speaker's statement will be limited to five minutes in duration. The public forum will be limited to one hour in duration. And with that, we'll open our public forum and I would invite anyone up to the podium who'd like to speak. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. oh, sorry. Ominous. <laughs> My name is Anna Wojnarowski, and I live at 436 Howard Street, Town Cliff. Yeah. Goodness. Okay. Uh, dear Dr. Mortimer and members of the Board of Education, my name is Anna Wojnarowski, and I'm the parent of a ninth grade student receiving special services in the district, and the mother of a third grader who has a about two weeks ago, is being homeschooled. I am one of several parents who have stepped into a leadership role this spring in our district CPAG. CPAG is an acronym for the Special Education Parent Advisory Group. As you may know, CPAG is a state-mandated, district-level, parent-driven group charged with providing input to the district on system-level changes in special education and related services. The role of an effective CPAG is to assess the global needs of the school community. Unlike the IEP team, which focuses on the needs of each individual student, the goals of CPAG are to improve the educational outcomes and well-being of all students, help identify unmet needs, help shape the development of programs, services, and policies, and to improve district culture and climate. Prior to March of 2020, CPAG meetings were organized and led by the Director of Special Services, Mr. Renshaw and Ms. Gluck, due to low parent participation and involvement. About, after about a two-year COVID-related hiatus, our district special ed parent advisory group became active on February 10th, when Director of Special Services, Mr. Renshaw, and Assistant Director, Ms. Gluck, organized a virtual meeting for district families receiving special services. During the February 10th meeting, Mr. Renshaw led the discussion about transitioning to adulthood, preparing students with special needs for life after high school. The well-attended meeting generated significant interest and animated discussion. Parent leadership was formed in keeping with the state guidelines and another CPAC meeting was organized and held in person on March 31st. Once again, the meeting was well attended and productive parents and the Director of Special Services engaged in conversation on topics ranging from the need to explain and break down the IEP document to the special needs of students during standardized testing. Parents asked questions and offered suggestions for the development of CPAG and the delivery, the delivery of information from the Department of Special Services. Mr. Renshaw and Ms. Gluck informed and educated parents 
listened to parents and responded to questions. The consensus among parents was that it was a positive and productive meeting. Word spread and a subsequent unofficial CPAG support group meeting was held the following week. About 15 parents from across the district came together for this last minute meeting. I cannot understate how enthusiastic parents are about participating in our CPAG for the betterment of the entire special needs community in our district and for our district as a whole. We are thankful to have a partnership with the District Special Services Administration. To paraphrase Mr. Renshaw, not every special service department in New Jersey allows parents to run their CPAG as directed in the state guidelines. However, Mr. Renshaw is following the state guidance and welcoming a parent-led initiative in our CPAG. For this, we are grateful. We are looking forward to the next CPAG meeting at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, May 20, um, May 3rd, 2022, which will be held in the high school media room. Among other things, Mr. Renshaw and Ms. Glup will discuss and help families understand the IEP document. We invite all families receiving special services in our district to join us at the May 3rd meeting and welcome their participation in our CPAG. An effective CPAG represents students in all its programs across all grade levels and needs and its success pivots on the involvement of parents. In closing, we would also like to extend, to extend the invitation to Dr. Mortimer and to the mo members of the Board of Education to visit our CPAG meetings. We hope you can join us. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bonnie Leon Brown. I reside at 456 Fairview Avenue in Westwood. I've been a resident in town since 1993. I am a mom of three children who grew up in this town and two of whom graduated from the high school in 2015 and in 2021. I am accompanied tonight by my husband, Jeff, my eldest son, Hagen, my amazing son, Ian, who is fiercely fighting the effects of his TBI and strokes. And I must include a shout out to my daughter, Kaylin, who is finishing her freshman year at college. We are also accompanied by very dear friends and neighbors whom we are forever grateful for their unconditional support of Ian's journey to healing and recovery. He is, a now, he is now entering his fifth year. I will also point out that this is what a community looks like when it supports each other. And this is what it feels like. It feels good. As this audience also represents the families you serve, we are truly blessed at, for the goodness and friendship. As you listen to my story about my son, we encourage you to take a pause and really think about your role on the board and the educational services you're elected to provide. We trust that you will lead with respect, empathy, wisdom, and absolutely ensure every child receives the opportunity to reach their potential to grow and to develop into the person they want to be through the practice of a fair, relevant, and appropriate education. On December 7, 2017, my son was in seventh grade, a straight-A student and a three-sport athlete. He was diagnosed with a rare and aggressive pituitary brain tumor known as a cranial pharyngioma. Ian was admitted two days later to the Children's Hospital at New York Presbyterian Columbia Medical Center after which he underwent a lengthy emergency surgery to remove the tumor. Secondary to the cranial pharyngioma, he suffered thalamic and midbrain infarcts, also known as strokes, that added another significant layer of complications to the effects already left behind by the blasted tumor. My son did not awake from surgery and he wept for more than three weeks at his lifeless body that was attached to umpteen machines via hundreds of tubes and lines. Three months in ICU, and another three months in acute rehab. He returned home six months later to a private and quiet homecoming. 
We knew that while there was no timetable for his healing, we also knew we needed to keep his complex therapeutic program moving forward. If anyone has shared a similar experience of an acquired lifelong injury, you know the aching pain, exhaustion, anger, emptiness, and uncertainty. You probably cried so hard like me to, to the point that you can't catch your breath, see out of your flooded eyes, or speak with any clarity. And lastly, if you ever shared a similar experience, you probably also pleaded every night to every god and spirit to take your life instead of your child's. From that moment, my journey was born, and it was up to me to fight to save my son's life, help him find his way back with greater purpose, and be loved. We work with a blank page every single day and fill it in as we go. The purpose of my revisiting the early phase of Ian's journey is to lay the foundation of his acquired medical needs that were dutifully explained at his first IEP meeting in September 2018, the start of his eighth grade. I will spill you the technical medical terms. However, my son battles adrenal insufficiency, hormone replacement, sodium dysregulation, temperature dysregulation, hypothalamic obesity, growth deficiency, although that is one area of great success, downward gaze paresis, and several items more. Upon meeting the players of the child study team, they offered to learn all about Ian. I provided a comprehensive summary with every detail of all his health challenges to include his two life-threatening illnesses, cognitive deficits, and physiological impairments. While knowing the school does not have a brain injury support team, we left with the confidence at the time that the directors would provide any and all supports with urgency and solicit credible and professional guidance as required. We were led to believe that a collaboration of empathetic and inclusive services would be provided, none of which has happened with consistency, diligence, and relevance to date. The pandemic year certainly stalled Ian's capacity for progress and I can only imagine that every child with or without individual education needs and plans were impacted as well. I thank the district for expanding my purpose and my role as an advocate, as I can say without hesitation that I am becoming the best advocate for my son. Learning from bad experiences and situations are as revealing as learning from good ones. We know that Ian's story is unique and challenging for most of us. Throughout his journey, he always showed compliance and does his very best under the most difficult cognitive, emotional conditions, and physiological barriers. The recovery plan has no timetable, and we will continue to follow his extraordinary lead. We appreciate the efforts of all the home instructors, teachers, and thera therapists for their support and intent to make a better world for Ian. Innovation S excuse and creativity. Excuse me, Ms. Byron. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I know it. Um, you have exceeded your five minute time frame. Um, you're going to give them a, another. I'll have somebody else read. No, it I, I, I'll I, make a I, motion I, to allow her to continue. I, I know. I just I, I, I only bring this up as so. Oh, yeah, so, so we have sorry. so we have the op <laughs> we, we have no we have the option of extending your time. Oh, are, are we are we thinking another minute, two minutes? Another page and a half. Okay. So 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 I just need a motion to extend um, motion time um, to allow her to finish up the page and a half. Who made the motion? Motion. Mr. Second. And, and second, Ms. Hanlon. All right. Um, all, favor. All, all, all in favor. favor? Just general? Aye. Okay. okay. Please continue. I'll, I'll be doing my last. Uh, we were, I want to just make sure that uh, the teachers, the home instruction teachers ever since eighth grade, the high school home instructor teachers, and the therapists at the school uh, since the start, they've been very supportive. Innovation and creativity are important as we navigate his health, growth, maturity, and mental wellness. We have witnessed the progress he is making and must continue to modify, take a pause occasionally, and yet remain consistent with our efforts to keep his trajectory moving forward. Ian's friends are the best, and they continue to help him feel normal and included. Last October, we had respectfully requested to trial a peer program that was intended to help offset fatigue between high demand classes and activities for Ian. Classes can overstimulate him and as re recommended by his neuro team of doctors and psychologists, a 15-minute peer break might be helpful to perhaps stave off fatigue so that he can continue to his next activity with more ease and wakefulness. The initial resounding reply was, 
it is not appropriate to ask students to miss academic time to provide peer support to Ingham. Needless to say, we all know students miss academics from time to time for non-academic matters, like football games. He had many friends who volunteered to make themselves available when their schedule permitted. After a heartfelt appeal to Dr. Mortimer, Dr. Mortimer, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to misspell that, your name, and those who initially denied the suggestion, we were pleased that his two senior friends could use their study hall period. We just will never know if this program could really work in its entirety had they been offered the opportunity. Uh, his junior class of friends had all volunteered, and I think it would have been a great program for them as well to show that their initiative to be supportive to a friend in need at school. With the next annual IEP review upon us, it is important that Ian's senior year be beneficial and appropriate and support his learning, therapeutic, and future needs as he moves into adulthood. We feel that after spending his junior year in the contained classroom, it most likely will not meet his growing needs next year. And we will, ask, we will task the school to collaborate and assist in a new placement with a view to an extended placement as in, in, in an adult program until the age of 21. Ian needs the following. It's a short list, but it's really a long list. So I will, summarize, I will just uh, give you a quick synopsis. Besides the educational coursework that he's doing now, his academic courses and independent living courses must include current events, health education, individualized and practical math, social strategies, calendar management, better use of assistive technology, meal planning and preparation, medical management, emotional regulation, self-management, small group counseling, related therapies, as well as to participate in community activities, vocational counseling and preparation for classes, Support should be at least, should have done this year. I, I was told that he was in the contained classroom and he would be getting some sort of um, community-based instruction and vocational counseling, which did not happen. Uh, he also requires neuropsychological, cognitive, and vision therapy. He graduated from pediatric therapies is young and is now under adult therapeutic care. School therapies will no longer be suitable. It's been four years at the high school and the same therapists and each of whom have worked with Ian since day one. And I think that they've reached their level that they can work with him and probably stretch their curriculums as best as they could. In closing, Ian always dreamed of doing big things in high school and his passion for soccer and lacrosse were so important to him, as many of us know. His dreams are still deep within him and we want him to know that he can live his dreams. We respectfully request a new placement for him to begin this summer or for his senior year in a program that is specific for TBI and stroke. Ian needs to be with peers and providers that fully understand him and his requirements and that those requirements are not ones that are just checked off on a piece of paper or filed away in a cabinet. He deserves to be in an appropriate educational setting where he can feel more comfortable with himself. We know the school has always been challenged by Ian and his IEP and he must be offered the opportunity to be in a class where he is not alone on an island. My family, friends, and I appeal to your senses and humanity to do the right by my son, who has endured more than all of us in this auditorium ever will. I further hope you have learned a little more about my son and his story and trust that within this presentation, you learned the medical rationale and reasons he is in his own lane and requires unique services. We want Ian to have a dynamic and special senior year and hope he will be able to participate with his soccer friends on the high school team. We tried for the past two years to have Ian participate. However, due to his complex school schedule and outside therapy schedule, he was really never afforded the chance to be as committed as he would have liked. We do not know from day to day where his journey will take us. All we know that is our family, that our family takes it day by day and we will be forever by his side. He is our miracle, and through his incredible strength, we are able to follow his lead and remain strong, focused, and positive. I really thank you for the time, thank you for the extended time and your attention, and hope you will get to know Ian as he, as he is the most remarkable human, and he deserves to live a long life full of purpose, dignity, love, and happiness. Thank you.
Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Hello, my name is Ray Rinaldi and I live at 16 Jacob Road in the township. I have been a taxpaying resident of the township for over 40 years, and I am very disturbed by what is being taught to our children in the public schools. Public schools are teaching doctrine. The definition of doctrine is the principle or body of principles presented for acceptance or belief as by a religious, political, scientific or philo philosophical group. I would argue that secular beliefs and ideology are being taught in public schools. Secularism is a belief system that rejects religion. Religion is a belief system that rejects secularism. Neither should be taught in public schools. I propose and I believe that what is being taught in public schools is political indoctrination and an ideological belief system that is currently not based on scientific evidence. For example, it is a scientific and biological fact that one is born male or female. Nobody can show me the facts that dispute that. Also, it is a scientific fact that human life begins at conception. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's also a scientific fact that human life begins at conception. The baby has its own DNA apart from the mother. Number three, climate change. It is a theory. Many scientists disagree with this theory. Teaching that climate change is a threat to the world is not factual, but is again an ideology. And yet those who disagree with climate change are called names science deniers. To deny the above examples are, in my opinion, the ones who deny science. Respect for all human beings is a philosophy we can all agree with. However, to specifically detail your own personal beliefs and philosophy that is hostile to one's personal beliefs is the height of discrimination. And I would again argue the ideology that is being taught to our children goes against, in my opinion, the majority of people's personal beliefs. Reading, writing, math, history, not revisionist history, and science, based on facts, not theories, should be tantamount to a child's education and development. Having the government teach sex to children is again, in my opinion, way out of the realm of public education and should be left to the parents' discretion and belief system. I believe parents need to speak up and defend their rights and their children's health. Otherwise, tyranny will ensue, and the indoctrination of our children with secular beliefs will continue. In closing, I'm just curious as to where the authority to implement belief system comes from. I believe you take an oath of office is this belief system incorporated in the oath you took? Would I be able to get a, a copy of the oath that you took? Anyway, um, I want to thank you for letting me have this time. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm sorry. We, we don't allow outbursts like that. I apologize. But if you want to speak, you're welcome to come up to the mic. OK. Would anyone else like to speak?
Good evening. First, I want to thank you all for your time tonight. As um, you sorry, just oh, I'm sorry. name and, and address for the record. Uh, sorry. Michael Piero, 18 Col uh, First, I want to thank you all for your time tonight, as this is your second meeting in as many weeks. And with the demands of life, I'm sure you're all pressed for time as much as I am and probably more. I want to bring up two district policies tonight, the first being 5756, transgender students. And this is the policy. I have it in my hands. And I don't have a problem with the vast majority of anything that's in here. Um, but just for, so there's no confusion, I'm just going to read a couple sentences out of here. The activities. The school district shall permit a transgender student to participate in gender seg segregated school activities in accordance with the student's gender identity. Under use of facilities, all students are entitled to have access to restrooms, locker rooms, and changing facilities in accordance with their gender identity to allow for involvement in various school programs and activities. The school district shall allow a transgender student to use a restroom or a locker room based on the student's gender identity. Um, language in this policy allows for male students to use the same restrooms, changing facilities, and locker rooms as our female students. It also allows for male students to compete against female students in their sports. I want to be clear that I firmly believe that everyone, no matter how they identify, has every right to choose how they want to live. But those rights should not violate the privacy of our female students, nor should they intrude upon the integrity of women's sports. My question is, was this language mandated by the state or was it developed and adopted by our district? I also want to ask, when will policy 5750.1 equal education opportunity vaccination status will be revisited. In February's May meeting, 1648.11 was adopted as a temporary measure that is set to expire in June, if I'm not mistaken. Some board members expressed that they needed more time to reflect on 5750.1 before they were ready to adopt a more permanent solution. Uh, I think that question was answered earlier in the meeting, and it's going to be brought up in May, 5750.1, right? Um, Dr. Mortimer, thank you for that presentation tonight. That was great. Um, that's, that is important stuff, that JD Pro activity and, and all that. And that's all I have. And again, thank you for your time tonight, everyone. Thank you. almost like afraid of the thing. Hopefully it doesn't go off again. Hi. Irene Fenargian, 446 Hoover Avenue. Hear me? Yes? Okay. Oh, you did? Oh, God. Okay, thank you. Oh, because um, I tell you, I was expecting, you know, the hand of God to come down again. Um, so um, I just wanted to... Um, express my continued support for um, the development and hopeful implementation of the policy to ensure that students, and I don't know if it includes faculty, that would be wonderful, are not um, discriminated or segregated from school based on vaccination status. So I really hope that that comes uh, before the board um, in May. I wanted to um, express my support for um, visiting through finances and facilities the expansion of single person uh, bathrooms. Um, I feel that that would ease the minds of many parents um, for those students who um, are identifying other than their born sex and those who do identify as um, their natural born sex. Um, lastly, I would like to share my appreciation for the recent email regarding um, 
the conservative approach the school is taking regarding the health and sex education um, and you know the availability of the opt out option but I would like um, I would like some uh, greater transparency for parents and earlier notification if any of those any of those um, topics are brought up in other than a health class for example the middle school had an assembly and I don't feel that parents were adequately notified of what was going to be presented within that assembly and so I would like that if there's any situation where these topics are brought up in um, other than health class whether an assembly or within a, a different uh, subject social studies science that parents are receive adequate notice and within that same email um, are advised that they have an opt-out option and what they need to do to opt out within that same email just for their awareness because parents have a lot to do and people forget. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Sabrina Kravchik, 270 Washington Avenue in Westwood, New Jersey. Um, my notes are a little bit scattered tonight, but the first thing I wanted to bring up um, is in regards to your training from last week. Um, and so I first wanted to talk uh, and read back um, Mr. Romano's um, part of the statement when we go into public forum talks about the board requests that individuals sign the speaker's lists, give the name and address, asks for all remarks to be directed to the board as a whole, not to individuals. Um, and I know that there was some training around some of this and lots of discussion um, last week. And I'm going to ask um, if you can please report back to us what um, further guidance or changes that can be made when those things do not occur. Because I have been seeing a lot of calling out of board members and as, a pub, as someone in the public, it makes me very uncomfortable. I come here, I try to follow the rules. I take the rules so that when my children in 20 years see these videos of their mom speaking, their mom has followed the rules. Um, so I'm hoping that um, we can button this up a little bit more um, when people call out, it's, you know, it's their, <coughs> excuse me, their five minutes of time. Um, I wanted to thank um, Allie from last week for speaking out about how I think my friends and I are all feeling about um, coming together as a community. I want to reiterate what my friend Kelly Sheenan had said last week, in addition to some comments made tonight in regards to um, students or staff members or anyone in the public of either of our towns, if you identify um, as a community member within the GLBTQ plus community, my friends and I are here, we support you. And if you need someone to talk to or need a cup of coffee, my door will always be open. Um, I think that there was a speaker tonight who um, spoke about her personal religious beliefs in regards to science being taught in our classrooms. And um, when you start talking about where birth or life starts, your opinion steps on my religious opinion and views. So let's, um, let's stay away from there. There's no reason for that in the public forum. It is a very divisive issue. It needs to not be here. Um, I wanted to recognize um, the student that spoke in regards to officers in the school. I think it was two meetings ago, and I, um, she spoke about it around the budget discussions, and I think that it was sad that in new business, 
um, no one even acknowledged what the student was saying. And I think that um, the board is there to serve the public and the students. And to just ignore that presentation um, might have been a miss. Um, I want to ask Dr. Mortimer, I know that in the February meeting I had asked about kindergarten numbers. You said you weren't quite there yet, so I'm hoping that we have those numbers. And to wrap up, I just want to, um, there's been lots of discussion in the, uh, in the community about board members who do not currently have students that are within our district. And I want to remind everyone that when we need to build the middle school, we need our empty nesters to go out and work for us to get us the money that we need to get better education for our kids. There is a place for every single one of you on this board and to not have a person in a position that does not have children in our district is a disservice to our district. We need someone from every walk of life to represent our entire community. And I hope behind the scenes that you all support each other in the roles and responsibilities that you bring to sitting on the board. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Coffini, 110 Western Avenue in Westwood. Uh, I'm actually glad everybody's sitting down for this one because I would like to compliment uh, Dr. Mortimer on her mental health initiative. Uh, it's very important for families, and even if it only helped one person, it's still worth it, and it's a great initiative, so good job on that. All right, um, so I mentioned in the last public session, I was concerned about the board replacing the assistant superintendent position with two positions. I was concerned that the old position was making around 190000 and without seeking the actual budget, seeing the actual budget numbers yet, I used a budget number of 125,000 for each position, which adds up to 250,000, which would cost the taxpayers an extra $60,000. I see on tonight's agenda that those positions are currently being hired, or actually, or actually being hired at 150,000 each, which is uh, 110,000 more than the previous position. Dr. Mortimer's, Dr. Mortimer's response was that I was, I was spreading misinformation and that it is actually saving the district $60,000. I would like Dr. Mortimer to explain how this is a $60,000 cost savings and if she factored benefits into this alleged $60,000 cost savings number. The first position is $40,000 less than the original $190,000. When you deduct that from the other additional salary of $150,000, you come up with an additional cost of $110,000. Even if these new positions absorb some stipends that people were receiving, how do those numbers actually add up to create this you know, alleged $60,000 savings? Uh, my other concern is that the added position gives Dr. Mortimer an extra person to delegate work to, making her job even easier. And I know she mentioned earlier that tomorrow she'll be sending out a newsletter to the parents addressing this uh, curriculum change, and I hope that um, she could spell that out clearly on how this will save uh, $60,000. I also spoke to advocate for the custodial and maintenance workers. Board goal number six deals with settling the contract with them. They are one of the lowest paid bills and grounds departments in the county. Uh, the board was able to find plenty of money for current and new administrative positions, including the elementary vice principal position that's on tonight's agenda, which is around $7,000 more than the previous person in that position was making. Uh, the board needs to do the right thing and find the money for the essential workers who have worked hard since the pandemic began. Also, please keep in mind that a 2% raise for somebody who's making $242,000 boils down to almost five grand, about $4,800, or let's say like a principal making $160,000, 2% of that's like $3,200. And that's much different than uh, you know, somebody who's making 35000 which that 2% is you know, $700. So you know, please do the right thing and uh, you know, take care of them. All right, thanks. Have a good night. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak tonight?
Good evening. My name is Elena Reyes. I reside at 275 Fourth Ave. I'm here today to speak about my concerns to the new sex um, ed curriculum. I am a mother of three, um, um, ninth grader, third grader, and kindergarten. Currently, my kindergarten is not in district. He's being homeschooled. Um, so I just have um, questions um, to the district now that the Governor Mercy has backtracked it on the new curriculum. What is the district? What are we doing? Where are we standing? What does that curriculum is looking like for September? Uh, because based on this is whether I'm going to keep my son homeschool and taking my third grader as well, um, because it doesn't align with our belief. Um, I feel that this curriculum will take the innocence of our kids, uh, which is precious. It's we can um, put them into something that they're not ready to, as a kindergarten, my son is not debating whether he's a boy, he's a girl, how do I feel today? How am I going to feel tomorrow? How am I going to feel in the next year? I think that that's something that it's not appropriate for their grade level, for their age, for their maturity, and I don't feel that it's something that needs to be in our public schools. Um, I don't believe that I need to opt my kids out of something that it's not age appropriate. We shouldn't have to have them question themselves at an early age. They know who they are, not because of what we're telling them. I'm not constantly telling my son that he's a boy. I have three boys. I'm not constantly telling them, you're a boy. That's not what we do at home. It's wh whoever you feel. You're open arms. I have a ninth grader where I have expressed myself to him. You're my child. You're my son. You are who you are, and you will be who you want to be, and we as a parents are here to welcome you in with open arms, regardless who you want to be in life or what you decide to be in life. Um, so I don't believe that as a kindergarten, they need to go to school to be, to have this ideology of, you know, who am I going to be tomorrow? Or, you know, I might look like a boy, but do, am I really a boy? I don't feel that that's age appropriate for him to have that in mind. So I would like to know where we're going with that curriculum. What are we going to adopt now that, as a district, you have the option to decide that? Um, also about that um, unvaccinated students, where are we? I know we said that we're having a meeting in May. Um, is all the board members going to be ready beforehand to decide what's going to happen that night and what policies we're going to adopt? Or are we going to keep playing the games or going back and forth? So I think it's time to really come together to decide this because a lot of parents need to decide what they're going to do for the next upcoming month. And summer's around the corner. You all have plans for the summer. So I'm sure there's not going to be everyone here in the summertime. So we need to adopt policies and tell us what the curriculum is going to look like before we go into the summer month. Um, that's it. Have a good night. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. If you do that one more time, we're going to have to ask you to leave. Okay? Thank you so much. Just, just to be clear, if you do that one more time, we're going to have to ask you to leave. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? By the way, I like the format last time of you guys all being down here, just, a, just an observation. We ready? Good evening. My name is Tommy Sneed. I live at 772 Cottsbrook Avenue in Washington Township. I want to first acknowledge Mrs. Vanderpile, the Washington School Librarian, for hosting the Bag of, Bo Bag of Books program last Friday. My wife got to read with my youngest learner, which was a great treat for both of them. I also want to acknowledge Mrs. Paliento and the entire Washington School staff for delivering a fantastic open house experience on Tuesday. It was great to see learners and parents walking around the buildings without wearing masks. As of next week, it will be two months with our learners attending school without being required for a mask and without a mandatory quarantine requirement. This week, Dr. Fauci announced, I quote, if you are saying we're out of the pandemic phase in this country, we are, end quote. I'm curious to know when the board will acknowledge that there's a large number of learners that are not vaccinated and don't plan to be. Short of a state mandate from the government, what is the district, Governor, what's the district's plan to offer unvaccinated learners a status of protected class? Such a policy will ensure these students will never, ever, ever again be discriminated against by this school district and forced to quarantine when they are healthy 
whether vaccinated peers are not forced to quarantine. If we've learned nothing else, we now know for a fact vaccinated learners do test positive to COVID, and they're actually COVID spreaders in our schools. In fact, there were several classes this year whereby the vaccinated learners were the learners who tested positive, introduced the virus into their classroom, thus forcing the unvaccinated healthy learners to go into mandatory quarantine. Sadly, I should say on a positive note, these healthy unvaccinated learners never tested positive. Sadly, however, they missed almost two weeks of in-person learning and were discriminated simply because they were unvaccinated. When is this intentional and willful discrimination going to stop? When is enough enough? I hope tonight this board will adopt a, try to adopt a permanent policy which equally protects all learners and discriminates against none. Our learners are counting on all of you to do the right, finally do the right thing and stop this blatant and intentional discrimination in its tracks. Every learner in our district, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated, deserves the same opportunity to a free and appropriate education. We can't undo the damage and learning poverty caused by the previous policy and st state mandate. We're simply asking for all of you to do the right thing and protect all of our learners. Tonight, I want to request a straw poll regarding the board's willingness to add at least one unisex bathroom to each elementary school, three to bathrooms to the middle school, and four to the high school. This would begin to address the willful ignoring of the language and board policy 5750.1 which Dr. Romano, Mrs. Hanlon, Mr. McAllister, along with Mr. Gersmeyer, Mrs. Switowski, Mrs. Mandeville, Mr. Abu Daoud, and Mr. Kalish approved in 2019. This is to finally provide legitimate bathroom op options for cisgender female students instead of the only current alternative option, which is the nurse's office. How is this never addressed by these three original board members, the board who updated this policy in March of 2019, and subsequent boards, it's disgusting, maddening, and embarrassing. I can only assume that they felt it was unnecessary to protect the rights of cisgender females who don't feel comfortable sharing a bathroom or a dressing room with a male transgender student. To be clear, to be clear, my comments are not trying to deprive, dilute, alter, or remove the bathroom rights of a transgender male student. The law and our district policy since 2019 ensures that no one can do that. I am trying to hold, finally hold this district accountable to the cisgender females who don't feel comfortable menstruating, urinating, or defecating with a male student in the next bathroom stall. Dr. Romano, hopefully you can put together a straw poll tonight so every parent of a daughter in this district will know exactly where all nine board members are. We are three years into this policy and it's shameful that we have to raise this point to this board. From what I read in the April 14th NJDOE cert clarification memo circulated to CSAs such as Dr. Mortimer, in the last three weeks it appears the governor and the NJDOE have formally and dramatically pulled back their shall, will, and must requirement to teach the sex ed curriculum is defined. It appears as though the decision of what to teach has been pushed down to the local community level, AKA us. Given the growing majority of Washington Township taxpayers and parents who are against the new curriculum, I formally request that all teaching of the new sex ed curriculum in our district stop immediately. And don't worry, I won't bang the, bang the podium until we as a community can decide what we want. Dr. Romano, hopefully you will allow another a straw poll this, for this board so we know exactly where all of you stand if any of you support the continued teaching of the sex curriculum as is, please vote yes, loud and proud. An abstain vote will be considered a yes with cowardice. Dr. Romano, it's up to this board to provide transparency and open board communication on this controversial issue. Unwillingness by this board to formally and publicly state their position can only be viewed as the collective need to protect the few members who won't publicly support my request. Please be a leader unless someone has something to hide. Stay well. And happy early, happy Mother's Day to some of the moms. Hi, Kelly O'Melia, 98 Goodwin in Westwood. Um, I just wanted to thank Bonnie Brown for coming tonight and sharing some of Ian's story with us. And on behalf of all the learners of the class of 2023, we love the Brown family and Ian, and I hope that you'll honor her wishes. Thanks. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Okay, then with that, we're gonna close for our public forum and I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Mortimer to respond. Thank you, Dr. Romano. Okay, I'm looking at my list of questions. Uh, Mr. Pirro, this is, all of our policies are written by a company for us. It's called Strauss Esme. And a lot of school districts use Strauss Esme to write all of their policies. There's 
so many policies, it would take so much time if we were to do them on our own, essentially. So they send policies to us a few times a year. Sometimes there's blanks where you can kind of fill in the blanks. Sometimes there's no blanks. So the, the, the policy you cited, 57 to 56, was mandated by the state. It's not mandated by the district in terms of the requirements that you, that you spoke about, okay? Questions, uh, well, there was a comment about, um, this is Krawcheck, who I believe left as well. So I don't believe that was a, uh, oh, she's here. Oh, I'm sorry, my glasses are on top of my head. Um, I don't th believe that was a student. You know, we, we did not snub a student, in my opinion. I don't believe, you know, we can talk later, but I don't believe that was a student that you were um, referring to. And then you asked about the kindergarten numbers. It's either 207 or 208. And kindergarten is a hot topic around the office because we're about to be uh, making the school placement letters come out by May 15th. So we're working on that tomorrow, in fact. There was a question about the, the, the restructuring of the curriculum office, which has already been explained uh, to Mr. Covini by Mr. Um, Rosado in detail, but I'll go over again what Mr. Rosado had said. The director of elementary ed and the director of secondary ed 150-150, we have our new Pascac Valley partnership, which is about 40,000, so that comes to 340 for the structure of the curriculum office next year. We're also going, in turn, be eliminating the lead teacher stipends, which are $120,000. We're going to eliminate one teaching position, which is 100,000, and then my salary when I was assistant uh, superintendent, that would no longer come into play. So we're looking at about 340 versus 405. So that's where the roughly $60,000 in savings comes from. Uh, the health standards. So there, again, you know, I wrote that parent letter. There's so much out there and there's misinformation. So there's the impression that we have the choice of doing the standards or not. And as of today, that's not true. We have to do the standards. My opinion is that the standards are poorly written because it'll say something and then at the end it'll say IE or EG and some districts are doing those terms and some are not. We had called the state for clarification as to what exactly or whether we had to teach the, those terms. Um, so nothing's really been walked back. If anything, I think the state's pointing the finger now at, the, at districts because they say, oh no, you know, you districts have the flexibility for how they want to implement these standards. And by flexibility, they mean the teaching materials. They don't mean you have a choice, do you want to teach these standards, do you not want to teach these standards. The flexibility, so to speak, comes into play as to what teaching materials you want to purchase to teach these standards. And as I've indicated in my parent letter, we chose the great body shop, shop after doing extensive research and we felt that that was most appropriate. I will tell you that this afternoon there was a meeting of the Bergen County superintendents and our county superintendent was, in, um, was speaking at the meeting and he said that we should watch very closely. Next week there's a state board of education meeting and we should watch very closely because it's highly likely the, the new health standards will come up at that meeting. So maybe there'll be new guidance to, uh, to districts where they're putting a pause on it. That would perhaps be what they're going to do. Uh, that they would be putting a pause on these standards and we don't have to implement them just yet, but uh, it sounds like there's going to be some walking back of those standards, in my opinion, but I will find out next week. The vaccination policy, yes, we have a policy committee meeting on Tuesday night, and I think after Tuesday night, we'll, we'll certainly be able to um, finalize anything for 5750, 5751. I know it's been going back and forth, but we needed to make sure that we did it right and we needed to get some legal opinions as well. I think that's all the questions that I have on my page. If I'm wrong, as I always say, give me a call tomorrow and I'll answer your question. Thank you, Dr. Mortimer. Uh, Mrs. Krauschick, just in terms of uh, reporting back on the, um, any additional guidance that comes our way regarding um, public forum and the way it's, you know, and, and, and the, um, the standards to which we hold speakers. Um, so 
I can tell you that at this point, again, I've engaged in policy review, spoken to the New Jersey School Boards Association, and spoken with our board attorney. And um, uh, not to quote myself at the last uh, at the training session, but I believe I, I, I believe I said something to the effect of um, how, as a leader, the the what the attorneys tell me, what school boards recommends, and what our policies state, um, it leaves you feeling like a complete and utter failure when you cannot defend what you know is wrong, well, or I should say when, you're not, can you, when you can't defend against what you know is wrong. Um, but that's where we are at this point. But I can promise you that I, I, I will continue to dig and dig and dig. And if I find something promising, of course I'll report out on that. Um, I'll bring it to the board's attention and, and, and we would look to, you know, I would look to have it implemented. I'm speaking on my own behalf when I say that. Um, so. And then just uh, you know, not 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 to you know, I, I don't want to I don't I don't want to uh, discount or 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 or, or, or um, ignore um, the two uh, requests for straw polls. But my stance on straw polls remains the same, true to form. It remains the same. Um, board members didn't do not sign on for that type of behavior. Um, it's divisive, and it does not serve the community well. It certainly doesn't serve this board well, and it's dis disrespectful to the office of the superintendent. So for that reason, I will always do what I can do to guard against um, responses from the public for straw polls from the board. And that concludes my piece. So with that, as I had explained before, I want to um, Great. All right. Well, then I'm happy to report that we actually have a bit of resolution that uh, eliminates the need for us to adjourn to executive session at this point. So we can actually move then to uh, resolutions. Okay. So again, in the, okay, so in the absence of our need now to adjourn to executive session, we're going to move right into resolutions. Okay, so we'll start with administrative and governance. And uh, Ms. Assembler, if you would move uh, motions A through E, please. Okay, I would like to make a motion to move um, agenda items A through E um, under administrative and governance. Second. Roll call. I'm sorry, discussion? Yeah. yeah. Mr. Pontillo. Uh, two points uh, for the public consumption section C uh, is regarding the uh, leftover emergency days that are added back into the calendar. Uh, where we have off on May 27th and May 31, extending our Memorial Day weekend. And for point F, which is approval of the uh, contract with the WEA, uh, I would like to echo the sentiments of my colleague, Mrs. Hanlon, uh, and thank the WEA and their team and the other board members that participated in uh, coming to the conclusion of that contract. It was a, uh, a respectful, well thought out, and appropriate negotiation and I'd like to thank them for, uh, for their partnership in getting that done in the manner it was done. So that's all. Anyone else like to comment? Okay, then let's move to roll call. Mrs. Colombo? Yes. Mrs. Hanlon? Yes. Mrs. Peck? Yes. Mrs. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Pontillo? Yes. Ms. Assembler? Yes. 
Dr. Romano? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. Uh, policy, Ms. Colombo? Uh, there are no items. Okay, let's move on. Um, personnel, Ms. Hanlon. Okay, I'd like to note for the public uh, as well as the other board members on item S. Um, it will just, uh, the addendum was printed with uh, more information, but uh, we're amending that just with a start date of 040422. Um, so with that, I'd like to move addenda items A through S, please. Second. Discussion? Okay, then we move to roll call. Mrs. Colombo? Yes. Mrs. Hanlon? Yes. Mrs. Peck? Yes. Mrs. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Pontillo? Yes. Mrs. Sembler? Yes. Dr. Romano? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, finance and facilities, Mr. Pontillo. Thank you, Dr. Romano. I'd like to make a motion to move agenda items A through Y. Second, Mrs. Peterson, Peterson thank you. Okay, discussion. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make a, a, a notion, uh, point out a, an item. The um, Media Center bid project is on here for rejection. Uh, we only received one bid, um, and it was o way over budgeted. Um, we are consulting with their architects to determine what's the outcome that we should proceed, uh, look into. Um, there was 11 bidders that picked up the packet and only one returned, so we want to see why. Uh, so I will report ba that back to uh, the board when I, when I can finalize that info. But for the for that time being, we're rejecting the, the bid uh, in its entirety. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, then let's move to roll call. Yes. I'm sorry, Mrs. Colombo. Yes. Mrs. Hanlon. Yes. Mrs. Peck. Yes. Mrs. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Pontillo. Yes. Mrs. Sembler. Yes. Dr. Romano. Yes. Motion carried. Okay, and then finally, uh, curriculum and programs. Um, and, and again, um, Mrs. Sembler, would you mind moving curriculum items A through J? Sure. Um, I would like to move curriculum and programs agenda items A through J. Second. Ms. Colombo, thank you. Discussion? I have some discussion. I just want to point out um, the motion. So item A um, is all the field trips that are coming back this year. You know, I always want to point them out. <laughs> it's very exciting for me. Um, and what's really special, I think this year, it's the first time the sixth grade is going to go on a field trip, um, and all of the middle school classes are going to go on a field trip this year for the first time. So six, seven, eight will all be going on um, different field trips, um, and all the field trips for the the um, kids range. I mean, you can look at it: Turtleback Zoo, Ellis Island, Long Island, the Maritime Aquarium, Liberty Science Center. Um, so that's really, really great. Um, the rest of the items are the science, new science textbooks. Um, that we talked about, and also um, a purchase for the French um, instruction that's online that's replacing um, the French teacher that we couldn't get um, a replacement for. That's it. Okay. Any other discussion? And thank you for that, Ms. Ms. Miller, adding the uh, added, in, you know, the, uh, yeah, appreciate that. Any other discussion? All right, uh, let's um, move then to roll call. Mrs. Colombo? Yes. Mrs. Hanlon? <clears throat> yes. Mrs. Peck? Yes. Mrs. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Pontillo? Yes. Mrs. Sembler? Yes. Dr. Mono? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, old business. Do we have any ad hoc, Mr. Pontillo? Uh, I have two items that I'd like to bring up. Uh, it was mentioned tonight a little bit in public session, and we received some information in the email about it. The updated policy 5750.1, uh, 
Um, there were two highlighted, highlighted additions to that policy. I went to bring up, I was going to read them, and for some reason my access to the document was denied. Um, but I, I can say that um, the second highlight, I believe it was, had reference to the local health department being able to mandate masks. Um, the, the, the other one being that the uh, executive orders from the governor would, would mandate masks. So I, I was kind of under, not understanding why the, uh, the local health department would be able to do that, and I did a little bit of research. So there's two um, statutes that allow for these emergency declarations. One is the Emergency Health Powers Act, which is NJSA 26 colon 13 dash 1, and the second one is the Disaster Control Act, NJSA A colon 9 dash 33. They're the basis for all the executive orders. Uh, I looked through some of the health directives that came out subsequent to all of the uh, executive orders, and the power of the health department is, uh, arises through the executive orders. And the, um, the health directives end, and I, I just uh, I noticed a commonality, so I'm just going to read a statement here um, that, that the way the health uh, things finalize. It says, the provisions of this directive shall remain in full force and effect for the duration of the public health emergency originally declared in Executive Order 103, because it was referencing back to the original one, pursuant to the New Jersey Emergency Health Powers Act, NJSA 26 colon 13 dash 1, unless modified, uh, supplemented, or rescinded. So the placement of the health department doesn't necessarily belong in the policy because it's already covered through the health care um, the Emergency Health Powers Act, which is the state statute that governs it. So there's no legal authority under which the health department could act to invoke a mass mandate that would come through the executive order. So I don't think that um, that should be in the policy, and I would uh, respectfully request that the, uh, the committee that is going to review that just take that in um, to consideration when reviewing it before bringing it to the board in May for a final vote. Uh, if you'd like, I will certainly put an email together and uh, send that to the committee prior to that. Um, the second, uh, if we want to stay on that, if anybody has any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, but I do have a um, another, it's on the health standard, so I, I guess I don't want to just jump around. So I don't know if anybody wants to talk about that. I was just going to ask, Dr. Mortimer, you spoke to the attorney specifically about that. Is there anything you want to say right now or would you like to follow up and then and then come back? All I can say at this time is that question had been raised to me. Um, I will follow up with the attorney, certainly, right. but I also emailed the local health department to ask that clarifying question as right. to can they suggest or can they mandate? And I have not received an answer okay. yet. So, so, we'll, so we will get follow-up information on that. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, and the second one um, is regarding the, uh, the new health standards. So on the... We were also sent this in the email. The uh, New Jersey Department of Education issued a uh, clarifying memo on the 14th of April 2022, clarification regarding 2020 New Jersey Student Learning Standards Comprehensive Health and Physical Education. Uh, at the end of that document, on page uh, 2 into 3, I'm going to read a sentence from it. Um, it is important to provide students language for an understanding of specific acts empowering them to stay safe, evaluate risks, make informed decisions, and communicate health issues or injuries if necessary. Further, youth who are unable to appropriately name sexual acts may not be able to accurately report instances of sexual harm or abuse if it occurs. I, I think that um, that relates back to uh, the performance expectations of 2.1.8. Point SSH.9. Point so, uh, and, and that would talk about uh, vaginal, oral, and anal sex. So, I, I find the document to be a bit misleading. Um, I don't think that anyone who is a victim of a crime would have to be able to accurately name the act in order for someone to act on it. And I almost think that they're using this as a guise to. Um, put this in front of the children, and I, I, I find a problem with it. I th again, I think it's misleading. I don't think that anyone is going to not have um, services provide them, for, provided to them or a crime investigator if they couldn't use the uh, correct legal term.
for, for an act. I mean, it's almost absurd, and I, I find it amazing that they would actually get printed uh, from somebody, because this stuff actually gets reviewed by people. So uh, I, again, would ask the uh, group of uh, people in committee who are going to review these health standards and make a determination, a recommendation to this board about them, uh, be cognizant of the misinformation that's actually being put out there because it's coming from all sources. So, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments regarding that new business item? Did I say new business? Sorry, old business item? Uh, further, if, uh, if anyone wants, I will, I will capture that in an email and send that to the committee prior to the uh, next meeting. Okay. Any other old business items? I just want to jump in, Dr. Romano. Um, oh, sure. I w it was pointed out to me that, Mrs. Reyes, I didn't answer your question. We do not teach these new standards in kindergarten. They're taught in grades two and five. That, that's the, the, gr the band that you can teach them in, but we wanted it in the highest, since we're obligated to teach it, we picked the highest grade levels intentionally. Thank you. Okay. I just agree with um, what Mr. Pontello read. What age group was that? That standard? Yeah. Oh, that's middle school. That's middle school, okay. Okay, that's, that's an important clarification. Thank you. Yeah, not second grade. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. So then let's move on to new business items. Mr. Pontella. Just want to give out a uh, shout out to the varsity softball team, Coach Collis, Coach Leetze, and all the girls. Uh, they played in the county tournament today. Uh, they, they made it to the uh, county tournament. Uh, they placed number 25, I think, at a 32. Uh, they uh, had a game at Atlantic Islands uh, this afternoon. Uh, they lost that game. Uh, they, they played well. They had some great spirit. They had a bunch of nice plays. So I'd like to just congratulate the coaches and the girls for their, uh, their achievement of that. Uh, it's good for the team. It's good for the school. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pontillo. Any other new business items? Ms. Colombo. Just, uh, just a thank you to everybody, the presentations tonight. It was a nice, um, mm -hmm. positive start. Dr. Mortimer, Ms. Murray, um, who am I forgetting? Mr. Oops. Rosato. Mr. Rosato, yeah, <laughs> sorry. The budget. <laughs> yeah, the budget, so thank you to everybody. <laughs> and, uh, and a shout out to Jesse George, because we're gonna be there tomorrow reading for the readathon. Mm -hmm. so I wanna thank them for inviting all of us um, just to continue with the positive. Feel good feelings this week. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hanlon. Yeah, just uh, on a note with Mrs. Murray, um, for those that are listening or watching us, uh, Mrs. Murray can also always use, um, if you uh, work for a business or you own a business and there's a way you can help out our students, um, please reach out to her at the high school. Um, it would be really nice. Um, I know that there's uh, a lot of businesses out there that are untapped as of yet or, or professions, not just businesses, professions as well. If you could do and help some of our students that way, that would be really great. Okay, thank you. Any other new business? Ms. Assembler. Yes. I just want to echo some of those sentiments, and I want to thank Dr. Mortimer for her presentation and her um, for piloting this program. Be kind to your mind. Like I think it's so important. We've been hearing about it. Um, I especially love um, the grades three to five buddies that's going to happen. Um, I think it's just such a nice idea that you know we talk about township and Westwood and some some of the separation, and then when they get to middle school, like they don't really know kids. So I think it's just like such a nice way. Um, to get the kids um, merging at an earlier age. So um, I thank you for that. It's a great idea. Um, Mrs. Murray and all the high school students, um, I didn't get a chance to, to thank them. Um, it was a great presentation, the work-based um, learning program that we keep adding more and more. It's just, it's so nice to see because not everybody, um, you know, the trades are so important and not everybody's gonna go to college. So. Um, I love seeing that that program is, is being built up. 
the budget presentation, thank you, Keith, like all the diagrams was really helpful. And I also just want to thank um, Mrs. Brown for coming in and sharing Ian's story with us. Um, you know, it was, it was very touching and moving, so thank you for, I'm sure it was not easy um, to do that. It's never easy to come up here on public forum um, and talk about personal matters, but um, I thank you for that. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Any other new business? Okay, then I'm going to ask Mrs. Semler to take us out. I would like to I would like to make a motion to end tonight's meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I think some people call it adjournment, Second. but that, that works. Thank you. you Second, Second. Ms. Colombo. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much.